Great. Thank you for all for coming and welcome to Gray Associates Masterclass 2, Reaching Curricular Efficiency. I would like to welcome Gray partner, Steve Profs, who has worked with a wide variety of institutions to improve their curricular efficiency. We encourage you to ask questions. Please take a look at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can click on the Q&A and add your questions there. We will get to as many questions as we can during the session and we'll follow up later with you if we do run out of time for all of our questions. We will send out a link that will give you access to a recording of the session as well as the session slides so you can review at your own convenience. And now without further ado, I will turn things over to Steve. Thanks, Marianne. So, the goal today is to give you an overview of how to look at curricular efficiency and, and program economics. Um, our starting point is going to be focusing on one metric that you can use to compare across programs, across institutions, across departments, and that's the cost per student credit hour. Um, we'll then address how do you figure out where you stand, where in, are you low and where are you high, how does that compare to other institutions. We'll take a look at policy decisions. The kinds of things you decide only at irregular intervals that end up driving curricular efficiency. And then we'll take a look at the recurring decisions, the kind that you make every year and sometimes every term that also drive curricular efficiency. We'll wrap up with then talking about how do you get the data to do this? And finally, how do you actually manage and implement improvements in curricular efficiency? So starting with the essential metric, cost per student credit hour. When we look at economics uh, for, uh, the, the, on the academic side of the institution, there's two very different ways you can look at it, two different types of ways to cut the information. On the left, it's looking at it by academic program. A program is, is a major or some, something a student thinks they're getting a credential in. And when you're looking at your programs, you need to look at a range of things. You need to look at the academic mission. How does this fit with who you aspire to be as an institution. Have to look at academic standards, um, everything from what accreditors look at to are we retaining students, are they graduating, are we teaching the right things, are students learning the right things. Have to look at the financial side, that's what we'll be focusing on today. And you have to look at the external market, student demand, uh, likely job outcomes and job opportunities and competition all in the context of people in process. So when you're looking at the financial side for programs, what you have to look at is the revenue from every student who majors in the program and the cost of teaching that student, regardless of who's teaching the courses. So if you're looking at an MBA pro, well, if you're looking at a bachelor's in business program, well, that, that business student is gonna be taking classes in English and math and maybe the arts and other electives. The, a fair share of the cost of each of those courses belongs as part of the cost of having that business program because it's part of what that student takes to get that degree. So that's the, the program view. On the other side, we're going to spend more of our time on today is curricular efficiency. This is not about so much the major, it's about the departments that offer the courses. So it's where faculty are assigned, it's where those kinds of decisions are made. So when you're planning course schedules, you're looking at the curriculum and program planning, you're looking at, should we offer a new course? All those things relate to driving the teaching workload, how much teaching we're actually gonna do at the institution, how many courses, sections, and so on. And therefore, what is it gonna cost us when we staff those? And how does that affect the resources available for the university's priorities, for enabling growth, or for that matter, a lot of schools are having to deal with cost reduction. So that's the curricular efficiency piece. When you're looking at understanding that information, you want to focus on the direct variable economics. The, the salary of the president generally is not going to vary with whether you're offering you know, three sections or four of, fresh, of freshman English. So you want to look at the things that are going to vary most. On the revenue side, that's going to be tuition and fees and grants and scholarships that the institution offers, which basically function as discounts. 
And it will also, if, you, if you're a public institution, there may be state or county or other public support that varies with enrollment. On the cost side, it's primarily gonna be the cost of your faculty, or technically if everyone, anyone who teaches a course, which may include some staff and may ex exclude some faculty for who, whose primary job, you know, for example, maybe they're librarians, is not just teaching. So it's looking at the, the variable costs and the variable revenue, and not at the shared costs or overheads. When we look at that, it is helpful to look at it in terms of a dollars per student credit hour. The beauty of that is that you can compare a big program and a small program, a big school and a small school. You can compare grad and undergrad. You can compare across institutions because generally speaking, a credit hour is one 120th of a bachelor's degree or one 30th of a full-time load. Um, we get to look across departments. It's, you can roll this up, run this course by course, student by student. And it's relevant for not only cost, but also for revenue and for the difference between cost and revenue, which we call contribution. That's the money that's left over to cover all the shared costs of the institution, um, whether it's the administration or the facilities and uh, marketing, en enrollment management, career services, student advising, and so on. The example here on the right shows at a typical public institution what the numbers might look like. Tuition and fees. It's $335 a credit hour. They're discounting 23% in institutional grants and scholarships. That's $78. But then the state's providing support th that varies with enrollment to get to a, a net revenue per credit hour of, of just over $400. In this example, the instructional cost is $168 a credit hour which is 42%, a bit, less, a bit less than half, leaving this amount, $234 per credit hour as contribution to fund all the other activities of the institution. By the way, for any given course, any given program, any given department, this number can be all over the map. A high number doesn't necessarily mean this is wonderful. A low number doesn't necessarily mean it's terrible. But the institution as a whole, across all the courses and programs and departments, has to be generating enough positive contribution so that the total cost so that covers the total cost of the institution. So figuring out where you stand. When we're looking at this cost per credit hour, how do we figure out what's a good number and a bad number? This is an example, it's actually a screenshot out of the system we use when we're helping uh, colleges and universities look at their economics. Uh, the example we're using today, we call contemporary university and it's, um, it's, it's doctored data. Here we have course level, uh, 1000s through 8000s. Many schools, it's the, the, it's the same thing as 100s through 800s. There are a couple of other quirks, but basically you're, um, lower level undergrad courses, your upper level undergrad and your grad courses. You can see students, credit hours generated, number of sections, average sections per course. If you're averaging only one section of a course, you don't have a lot of choice about how many sections to offer. And if you're looking to reduce the amount of teaching you're doing, you have to be looking at, do I need that many different versions of a course? Whereas back here for the freshman level courses, you get to decide, do I really need you know, five sections of that course or would four be sufficient? One of the most telling patterns, which is quite consistent across schools, is the cost per credit hour when you're looking at different levels of courses. In this case, the thousand level courses, those kind of entry level courses in each uh, department, are averaging a cost of $75 per student credit hour, then up to $124, $173, and $252. So looking at those numbers, this the um, upper level courses are, oh, about three or four times as expensive as the lower level courses. You can see total amount of contribution generated and contribution per credit hour. 
but I'm going to focus for a moment on the cost. What's driving this is that the cost per section, basically the cost of putting a faculty member in front of the room is somewhere in the eight in the six thousand to ten thousand dollar range for these classes. It's not that unusual a number. If you want to think about it in kind of just general terms, full time faculty member, national rough average salary and benefits cost about hundred thousand dollars a year. If a typical load is four sections in the spring and four in the fall for a faculty member, that's eight sections a year take their $100,000 cost, divide it by eight. In that case, the cost for the full-time faculty member would be $12,000 per section. These numbers are lower. Part of that's gonna be because not all of them are taught by full-time faculty. Part of it may be that their loads are different or their pay levels are different. If you take for a moment two examples here, the 2000 level courses, are costing $8,000 a credit hour, $8,000 per section, and so are the 4,000 level courses. They're just slightly higher. But if you look at the cost per credit hour, it's more than two to one, $124 versus $252. What's going on here, and again, this is not an unusual pattern, is that while the cost per section is about the same, the 200 level sections are delivering an average of 65 credit hours per section. And only about half that, 33 credit hours for the 400 levels. And that's because the class sizes are about 20 students for the 200 and barely half that, 11 students for the 400 level courses. And in both cases, they're worth about three credits. This is, this is a little rounded. Um, but basically, if you have the same cost per section and you only have half as many students in it, you're going to end up with an instructional cost per credit hour that's twice as high. A couple of other things to notice when we're looking at this page. As the full-time share of the number of sections goes up, you typically see an increase in the cost per section. It's not an, an exact relationship. There are some um, part-time faculty members who are paid a, a lot, and there's, but in most cases, they're paid considerably less than the full-time faculty. Um, but the number of credits and other things like that can make a difference here. Um, but generally speaking, one of your levers is your mix of full-time and part-time faculty. One of the ways to look across departments. In this case, we're looking, the, the sample here is an intro English class. We can take the cost per credit hour and compare it to an average and say, if that cost per credit hour in this top one here is $218 a credit hour, if that were the same as the average for all these, instead of costing $21,000 to teach those 99 credit hours, it would have cost $7,000 less. So this cost over threshold is the potential savings if the cost was no higher than the average um, or whatever threshold is chosen. So it's a useful way of saying, when I'm looking at a combination of how expensive is it per credit hour multiplied by how many credit hours are we generating? So, you know, if you've got one class with three students, it's expensive. That's generally not going to be make or break for you. But if you're doing that for a great many students and a great many classes, it adds up quickly. So if we look here, here's an example of using that. In this case, the average it's using is $129 per credit hour, which happens to be the average of everything on the screen and, and down. I chopped this off at a reasonable size to fit here. Here it's by department, and what we're looking at is undergrad course uh, curricular efficiency. So the line at the top here, visual and dramatic arts, is relatively big. 2,000 students took at least one course during this uh, year, and they generated 13,000 credit hours spread across 469 sections. 
And by the way, almost every course was a one section course. So if you think about the work that the faculty is doing, it's more work to teach uh, two sections of two different courses than to teach two sections of the same course. Hey, Steve, we do have a, a couple of questions I think that are, are relevant to what you're speaking about. Uh, okay. The first one is, how do you figure out the instructional cost per section, especially if multiple sections are offered? Do you average the salary for faculty, such as assistant, associate, full ranks plus adjuncts? So what, what we'll be doing, I'll explain this a little, a little further in, but high level, what we're doing is saying for every section, who taught it? What were they paid? Are there any special stipend rules? Um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, there are stipend rules that vary sometimes even within an institution by department. There's some I facetiously refer to as, you know, on Tuesdays on leap years, you know, there's an extra X pay if your last name begins with whatever letter. Um, so getting all that right does take some time, but if you take the salary and benefits cost for a faculty member, if, it, if they're an adjunct, it's straightforward. You can tie it, you know, directly to the course. If they're full-time, you have to take into account things like release time and loads and so on. But so the costs come down right down to the section. And from there, when we get to program economics, we can allocate them to the students in the section. So if there's 10 students each getting three credits in a, in a certain class, they would each get one tenth of the cost. Um, so this is this goes all the way down to the this this section of this course during this term, by this modality. By the way, if if, if we need to get there, Marianne, you say there are other questions as well. Yes, there are a couple of uh, sort of related questions, such as how's the discount rate calculated in these examples? Okay, the discount rate is. For every individual student, we know their the top line tuition and fees they're charged and the institutional discounts they receive. And then we can roll that up, adding up all the students. Um, on the program side, you know, for a given student, it's based on what their major is. On the course side, we're basically allocating the students' tuition and fees and discounts across all the courses they took that term. Um, so the arithmetic, there's a lot of the arithmetic, but the individual arithmetic you can trace through and see it makes sense. It's just there's you know a huge amount of it. Um, there there are some tricky questions when dealing with discount rates. There are funded and unfound unfunded scholarships and you know foundations that provide them. So it, it takes some discussion and, and thought about exactly what to include and exclude you know, for any given institution to make the numbers you know accurate and representative. And I will ask one more question um, and then let you continue on. What is count of sections? Is that the number of students in all sections? Okay, so the count of sections, if we take the top line here, visual and dramatic arts, and let's say uh, there's a, a course there in, you know, theater 101. Um, if, the, if, there, if the course is offered spring and fall, one class each that would be two sections one in the spring one in the fall the number of students is the number of unique students who took that class so typically it's one student taking it once by the way if you've got a course like you know math 100 where you have a high dfw rate you may have the same student taking that class twice or three times um but so that the count of sections the number of those individual sections where the course is taught um, to a group of students, same time, same place. Um, one of the things we do have to be careful about is there are cross-listed courses where you don't want to double count anything. There are also courses like you know, Studio Art 2, Studio Art 3, and Studio Art 4 may not be cross-listed you know, from a registrar's point of view, but they're all taught in the same room at the same time by the same person. And so again, you have to be careful there not to double count any of the costs. So continuing, uh, Marion, are we ready to jump back to this? Absolutely. I think we we do have some other questions. Uh, uh, we'll try to get to them later. And if not, we'll reach out to you individually and make sure they get answered. Sounds good. So th this cost over threshold becomes a metric for saying where do was, does it look like there are the most opportunities for cost reduction? Or where do I need to pay the most attention? Or 
if so and so, you know, has an open faculty line because someone retired, where do I need to squint hardest at? You know, can we afford to do that? Is that the right place to redeploy resources? Obviously, cost is only a piece of the equation. There are other things like strategy is a scenario we're trying to grow. And there are, and obviously things like value and you know how important is this, which is a much softer types of things. The fact there aren't hard numbers for them doesn't mean they're less important. It means you need to consider all these different pieces. So this becomes the way. So if we're going to look at visual and dramatic arts, because it was at the top of the list here, you know, one of the things we'd look at and we'd say, okay, the cost per section is not that high. In fact, it's half the numbers for business or engineering. But the number of credit hours delivered is the lowest of anything we see here per section. That's because we're averaging eight students. So the fundamental challenge here in terms of cost, and the reason that this is almost double the, uh, the threshold, is because the classes are very small. Why they're small and what could be done about it is something that requires you know, all sorts of judgment and insight about the specifics. But it basically says it's not that the sections are expensive, that the faculty is you know, very highly paid or something like that. It's about class size. And if I had to guess, I would assume that part of what's pulling this down is things like private music lessons, uh, since we're talking uh, oh, visual, if, it, if that's in dr visual and dramatic arts, um, those types of things tend to pull down. They're often are sometimes zero credit courses. Though here, the credits per student are pretty consistent. Outliers, engineering, and the chemical and biological sciences are lower. If I had to guess, that includes that there is some zero credit labs rolled into the numbers. And how schools count labs versus lectures when they're required together. Again, there's some inconsistency and you know you need to spend some time working on to come up with the something that captures reality in a way that's useful for making decisions. Another thing that's useful to do, this data comes from iPads with, with some tweaking, is uh, rather than from your own internal data about cost structures, is looking at student faculty ratios. It's a nice way of getting a sense of where do we stand compared to a relevant peer group. So, you know, but you have to use them with caution. So with peer groups, you know, schools around the same size, around the same mix of undergrad and grad, you know, selectivity, mission, part-time and full-time get it coming to play. The way these are calculated in IPEDS is um, for part-time faculty, if each head counts as a third of a person and the equivalent for part-time students. So if you get wildly different mixes there, it can mess the ratios. But you can see in this case for 106 private liberal arts colleges last year, the most common uh, student faculty ratios were 11 or 12 or maybe 13 students per faculty member. Keep in mind, these are not class sizes. It's looking at total fa faculty headcount, total to student headcount. And the, the blue line shows the profile that 25%, basically the bottom quarter had 10 ratios of 10 to one or less, and the top 25% had ratios of 14 to one or more. Pretty wide range there. You know, it's a, it's a fairly crude measure, but it's interesting. You can look at the ones on the right and say, are there any schools there that feel kind of like us that you know we have some respect for? Because that tells us maybe it's worth, maybe there's room to move to the right, which is is lower cost than moving to the left. One of the dangers of using this data is that you have to be really careful about what peer group you use. So this is private liberal arts colleges um, that were relative that that were slightly selective, for lack of a better term. This is uh, public regional universities that are are relatively unselective as well. Um, in both cases, these are clients you know that I happen to have worked with recently that 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 defined what what the relevant peer groups would be, or we defined for them. What I want to call out here is the scale on the bottom. In this case, the middle 50% is 11 ratios of 11 to one up to 13 to one. 
Here, that middle half of the schools is, is anywhere from 16 to one to 19 to one ratios. 50% higher, or if you prefer one third less faculty for the same stu size student body is here. So the conversation with a liberal arts college here basically begs the question of, is this peer group as a whole what the, the model we wanna use? Because while we may share aspirations about the kind of education we're providing, you know, cost and affordability are big issues too. And maybe we need to be thinking about some of the things that other kinds of schools are doing as well. So the peer group becomes important. Another way to look at uh, comparisons, um, one of the things we do is we collect benchmark data for all the schools that use our systems. We ask for their permission and they're in a da benchmark database that you can look at individual courses and say for a given course, you know, what are what is our cost? What is the median cost in the sample? What are the low and high? You have to be a little careful here. You need to be thinking about level, you know, a 100 level course versus a 400 level co course um, online versus on campus, you know, lab versus lecture and all those other things. But it's a way of getting right down to the nitty gritty of, you know, where are we high, where are we low? with the implication of, and therefore, where do we need to think about doing something different versus there should be, you know, change and it should be a low priority and let's let's look elsewhere, things are okay. Or maybe we're even understaffed for what we're trying to accomplish. When you're thinking about curricular efficiency and the bottom line, you have that direct instructional cost per student credit hour where we started this. If you look at the drivers of that, there's what is the cost to put a faculty member in front of the room, in effect? What's the cost per section? How many students are in that class? And how many credits is the class worth? And when we were looking at the numbers a moment ago, I was basically walking you through that to see how it affected the direct instructional cost. Now, where the weighted average cost per section comes from is basically the mix of how much full-time how much overload, how much adjunct taught or staff taught courses, what are the compensation levels, what are your loads, how much of the time do you actually expect your faculty to be teaching versus doing other things, all end up driving your costs. The Most of this chart falls under the category of policy decisions. How many credits a course is worth is a policy decision. The target of what's full-time versus part-time instruction is a policy decision. Same thing about pay levels and, and, and loads. In contrast, the things that drive class size are really the scheduling decisions made every term. How many sections am I offering? Am I offering this class every term or alternate terms? And so those are under the category of recurring decisions. So if you want to affect your direct instructional costs per credit hour. This is where the, the actions happen, and these are the effects. And by the way, if you do something like change your teaching loads, if you make, if you raise the loads, you only save money if you end up with fewer people who you're paying. So the policy levers go are can be essential as part of a process to, to become more efficient. And by the way, going the other way, reducing your teaching loads, I've spoken to a bunch of schools that um, you know, had had four and four and went to three and three kind of standard loads. What well, you're raising the amount of teaching you need to do, in that case by 25, by, by a third. And that will drive up your cost per section because it's gonna, um, you basically need now to teach 12 courses, you now need four faculty members instead of three in a, in a term. Steve, do you have time to for a recommendation question? Sure. What is your recommendation for allocating revenue slash cost by department? For example, a business school brings in a thousand BSBA majors. All take English 101, but half the students withdraw before they take business 101. 
Should all the revenue slash costs for English 101 go to the English department or should the business school get credit for attracting students to take English 101? That's kind of a um, complicated question. It's a good question. I'm gonna back up to this slide. It depends the question why you're asking the question. Because one of the problems is when you do those allocations, the question is why and what you can use the information for. You know, classically in a university, what happens is the costs for within a department, the costs go against their budget. We've got 10 faculty members and we've got the cost for 10 faculty members. But where an English department, and while we teach every student, we only have, you know, half a dozen majors. So we get no, no revenue. The fact is we're teaching, you know, almost every student in the school at one time or another. And so that's a mismatch. When, the way I prefer to look at it is when I'm looking at academic programs, the revenue follows the student, but the cost follows the student as well. Because if you think about it, programs are one of the big things that either attract or drive students away from a given institution. You go to a school so you can study X. Um, and you avoid a school because they don't offer this thing that you were looking for. And that tends to be true for programs, but not for individual courses. So when you think program, uh, crudely think program and profit go together. You have to look at revenue and costs together. When you're looking at efficiency, at this point, you've now said, okay, I know the students I'm serving. And the question is, what is an efficient way to accomplish our educational goals and commitments to those students? And in that case, revenue is kind of outside the, the, the whole question. The question is, I have to deliver this many credit hours in this department or this level of education or this level of you know, information and insight. And what's an effective way to do that, an efficient way to do that? And so revenue doesn't need to be allocated. It can be, in which case it should follow the student into the class. So if you're looking at that um, English class taken by business students, it would be reasonable to say, from a program point of view, the business major gets the revenue from those students and the cost of teaching them, even if that cost was created in, a, in, a, in an English class. But you can also look at it from a department point of view and say the department has the cost of teaching English, but they should also get a fair, also get a fair share of revenue from those business students who are in that English class. The two should always match up when you're looking at that kind of profitability or contribution, I guess is a better term for it. But generally speaking, when I'm looking at revenue, I'm focusing on the program side of it and not the efficiency side. So going back to where we were a moment ago, when we look at policy decisions, for full-time faculty, we can split their compensation into three buckets. There's teaching costs. There's the amount of what they're paid that goes towards teaching classes. So if the standard load is four and four, and they end up teaching four courses in the first spring and four in the fall, and they don't have any releases and they don't have any overloads, it would all go to teaching. Then there are releases. These are the, the formal releases often documented, it seems like, by a you know, post-it note on a dean's desk. But nonetheless, this is the, you know, the release of, of, a, of a course, uh, of a, the equivalent of a course a year or a course a term to be a program a chair or program coordinator. Or maybe it's a release because they have funded research, so there'll be half-time research, half-time teaching. But it's the explicit decisions of these people have a responsibility other than teaching and therefore, we're going to reduce their course load so they can accomplish those other things, as opposed to the standard, you know, service and research that are part of a load, you know, in, in fact, embedded in, in the teaching load assumption. The last piece we call unallocated. And that's literally what it is. We look at the total compensation. We look at teaching loads. We look at, at uh, how many courses a person teaches and how much release they have. And if you add up the number of courses they've taught and the number they have released for, and that's less than the standard load, we put the leftover piece into unallocated cost. And what that lets us do is if you have you know, a, a faculty member who's making 100,000 a year 
but he's near retirement and only teaching one course, it means we're not throwing $100,000 of cost against that one course. It means we're throwing, call it $12,000 against that one course and the other 88,000 goes into unallocated. So what this lets you see is how am I using my faculty time? And are we okay with that is an implicit question. Um, and the numbers you know, do vary considerably. A school I was at um, two weeks ago um, was spending $10 million a year in a combination of release and unallocated faculty cost, um, which was somewhere around um, an eighth or a 10th of their total full-time compensation for faculty. So the, the no, and, that, and that was a high number. Um, it does vary. But you want to understand those different pieces because these are levers where you can do things. If you look at actual loads, and this is a fairly typical pattern, you get a big bell curve. So at the bottom here is the number of, in this case, is it, it's uh, class credit hours. So the, the, the high point here, 46 faculty are teaching 18 to less than 21. Three credit courses, that's basically three courses in the spring and three courses in the fall. And that's the most common load here. But there are ones who are teaching a lot more and ones who are teaching a lot less. Some of this is going to be releases. Some of it's going to be people who left during the academic year or who started during the academic year. And some of it's going to be quirky things, sabbaticals or, or whatever. Someone you know, who's nearing retirement is on a reduced load. The cumulative curve here gets you up to 100%. What you can see is basically a very wide spread. Um, and that, that's the pattern. The ones at the high end, you also have so, often have something quirky. It's supervising um, student teachers or supervising um, nursing clinicals or something like that. You can end up with some very high numbers. But it's worth looking for the outliers and understanding what's going on. And also looking is three and three really the intended load or should it be something different? And we're having a lot of schools asking those questions recently. When you look at cost to teach, for a given section, and again, this is an example, um, courses taught by full-time faculty tend to be much more expensive than courses taught by adjuncts. Salary and benefits, you know, divided by how whatever their teaching load is versus the per course compensation. Um, three to one is not an unusual ratio. Now, by the way, overload courses are often more in that cost level, like an adjunct. Um, and so changing your overloads can change your weighted average cost uh, quite well. But understanding this is an important piece of understanding why so many colleges have been reducing their full-time staff and adding part-time. One of the things that's interesting when schools look to save money, often what they cut is the area where it's easiest to cut, which is adjuncts and overload, which happens to be the cheapest cost per credit hour courses from the institution's point of view. So in effect, that raises um, your cost per credit hour, uh, sorry, your cost per section when that's where the cutting happens. You know, the easiest place to cut is just when someone retires, not to replace them in kind. And those decisions are quite important. Steve, we have a bunch more questions coming out. We have a very, very uh, smart and engaged group here. Do you mind if I ask a few more? Sure. Hi, I'm going to start with how does this show faculty that have course relief from serving as an administrator? So the way we handle that is that the, the release or relief or, or reassign time goes into the release cost. Now, by the way, some we will find examples, and I'm sure many of you have seen, where someone is teaching a full load and has a release and they're just working extra. In that case, we'll spread it over that. Um, but one of the things that this is a measure of for most schools that, that are teaching focused rather than teaching and research or, or research focused, this is a measure of you know, administrative load for work um, for faculty members. So if you're proliferating departments, you know, that cost is going to go up. 
or prolifer proliferating majors. So where do the research and service requirements for faculty go? Do those also go to the re release costs? Um, short answer is usually not. For the vast majority of institutions in, in the United States, they're primarily teaching institutions. Um, and the, the way you can, the way I ask that question, trying to understand that with the schools I'm working with is when you're making a decision about whether to hire someone in the faculty, not who to hire, but specifically, is there an open line we need to fill? If the only thing driving that is the question of, do we have enough people to teach what we need to teach and the right skills to teach what we need to teach, then you're a teaching institution. If you're saying there's re if you're saying I would hire this person because we need to do more research, then that's not just a teaching institution, that's a teaching and research or research focus. What we hear from at least 90% of the schools we work with is the decisions always come down to whether to hire anyone is based on what courses need to be taught and, and, and those kinds of factors. The choice of who to hire is going to take into account research very often, you know, depending on the kind of school. But whether to hire, not as opposed to who to hire, depends on that. If that's the case, then what you're really paying for, because it you know that from why you hired them, is the teaching. And so the so the administrative, you know, the, the, the classic service and research responsibilities of a faculty member. Those assumptions are already baked into teaching and they're part of the cost of delivering instruction. That's Thank a long winded you. answer. Um, the exception you know, for that is a school where research is, is a more part of the mission. So if you're a school that has where you have faculty who are doing funded research, for example, what I would expect to see is release time for those faculty to, to support the research activities. So maybe the faculty, maybe the standard load is four and four, but the faculty in a certain department um, or some of those faculty have releases of half that so they can do research. That would show up under release cost. And so they only half their compensation would be assigned to teaching. Steve, the good questions just keep on coming. Another one is how should I calculate faculty costs when they're paid an overload class at an adjunct rate to teach an extra course above their 12 credit load per semester. Is their salary spread over all 15 credits evenly? And uh, as a follow-up question, separate question is, are there any financial reasons for not hiring all faculty as adjuncts? So, <laughs> so two different questions there. Mm -hmm. The first one and how to handle the, the accounting for overload. For the purpose of this kind of analysis, and by, you know, for most of these questions about how should you do X, it probably depends on the, on the questions you're trying to answer. But when you're looking at what is a cost to deliver courses, when you've got a given faculty member who is teaching five courses this term instead of four, for example, is getting paid extra at a reduced rate, at that, that overload rate, the specific class that's the overload class is an arbitrary decision. It's the last class they're assigned. But if they you if you eliminated one of the other classes they were gonna teach, then the other one would pop up to just be part of the standard load. And therefore, I think it's healthiest to look at the cost for the faculty member that term as being spread evenly um, across the courses um, that, that they're teaching. And by when I say evenly, I'm also saying a four credit course gets more cost assigned within the three credit co course. Um, so that that's the overload piece. The other is, why am I bothering to hire full-time faculty at all? To, to paraphrase the question, there's a combination of reasons. One is that there are accreditor requirements of different types. Another is there are administrative requirements of different types. So you know, if you're having a, a program, you need someone to, to, to coordinate or chair that program. Another is that you know your students may really be depending on being able to get um, advising and coaching from the faculty informally in ways that full-time faculty can be available and adjunct faculty are less likely to be available. Um, 
So the right mix of full-time and part-time faculty um, is very institution and, and mission dependent. Um, there's another cut on it too. There, there are part-time faculty who are basically, you know, as qualified as, but underpaid versions of full-time faculty. But there are also some areas where the part-time faculty are, you know, practitioners outside academia who are teaching and bringing something to the table in terms of that outside experience, which, which is different. And sometimes it's very expensive, <laughs> like you know, if they happen to be a surgeon in a medical school, and sometimes it's, it's much less expensive. So knowing the right mix is, um, there's not a one size fits all question. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Um, we went past this one there. This is um, an example, it happens to be real data, but it follows a pattern we've seen now in a number of institutions. What this is showing you is two freshman classes, basically a freshman English class and a freshman math class, where the both courses were offered both online and on campus and had a substantial number of students taking each and earning a substantial number of credit hours. Now let's take the, the, the English course first. The cost uh, per credit hour is actually higher in this case for online because the class sizes were almost the same size. There's only so many students you can have in a freshman comp class because grading all those papers is a massive amount of work. Um, and it was, for whatever reason, slightly more expensive to teach the online version. So it ended up together, made it slightly more expensive to teach the online. In contrast, for the math class, the cost per section was similar, slightly higher for the online, but there were 50% more students in the online class, which uh, brought down the cost to, per credit hour to significantly below. But actually the real reason I'm providing this one is DFW rates, DF or, or withdraw from the class. So basically students who attempted the course and did not succeed. And these both freshman English and freshman math are notoriously you know, high DFW kinds of classes. What we see here for English is what my preconception said we would have had, that the DFW rate was much higher for students taking it online. But I was surprised, and I've seen this pattern elsewhere, that for the math classes, the online students were actually more successful. And it's an interesting pattern. So there is not a one size fits all. There's not a single rule of thumb to apply when you're deciding, you know, who do I let take online courses or is online better or worse? Um, one other note here. That $150 per credit hour, if you only look at the successful credit hours, for, as opposed to all the credit hours, so you back out the 32% who didn't actually earn credit for the class, that cost per credit hour is now over $200 per successful credit hour. So this can have a material effect on what your cost structure is. And by the way, odds are some of those students are taking the class a second or even a third time because they didn't pass the first time. So that's a modality deep cut. Let's look at recurring decisions. The idea of this kind of analysis and the recurring, the recurring decisions here, we're basically talking about um, class scheduling kinds of decisions. What you're looking for is a way to reduce the amount of teaching that needs to be done. This is not about piling more work on the faculty, but if done well, it can reduce the need to hire more faculty. So when someone retires, you may not need to replace them one for one. You may be able to instead hire into another area that's growing or you know, redeploy either to save money or to support your other priorities. You know, If you control the costs, it makes, helps make college more affordable. If you're facing budget cuts, it helps you figure out how to do this in ways that minimize um, you know, the worsening of the education or excessive workloads. 
and it frees up resources so you can invest in the places where there are opportunities. So that's what we're, that's what we're striving for typically. This is a, a, a screenshot of class size data. Across the bottom, you've got the number of students per class. The height of these bars is the number of sections in a given year at a given institution. And then the color coding is the type of class. So these one student classes are very heavily independent studies. And one of the things we hear a fair amount is for schools have a lot of these of, wow, I had no idea how many we were doing. Now, independent studies can be a great thing, one-on-one -on -one, you know, relationship with a teacher and student doing something special, or they can be a Band-Aid because you canceled the class and the student still needed it to graduate. And so that can also be kind of a warning signal of what we're doing in scheduling, and is that okay? The bottom chart has the same bottom axis, but the bar heights now is number of credit hours delivered. And basically a class of 50 students is gonna deliver a lot more credit hours in total you know, per class than a class of one student. So you see the whole graph skews to the right. So if you look at this, the 50% mark, from a, from a faculty member's point of view, basically half the classes are, call it 13 students or fewer, and half the classes are 13 students or more. You know, the midpoint is that 11 to 15 classes. But if you ask a student, they're earning the credit hours disproportionately in classes of 30 or more students. So there's always gonna be a difference in perspective from what the faculty see and what the students see, just because a lot more students per faculty member in bigger classes. Um, a little exercise you can do, and this is crude, but it gives you a sense of the magnitude of some of these numbers. In this example, the school was teaching 300,000 credit hours in a recent year. If, for example, they said our target class size is 23 students, and the average class should be a three credit hour class. Well, 300,000 credit hours divided by three per student divided by 23 students per class would give you 4,300 sections that you need to teach, 4,373. In actuality, they had 4,900 sections, almost 5,000 sections that they taught. The difference between those is 584, we'll call them excess sections one's in excess of these you know, potential policies. Well, 584 extra sections, if your standard is eight sections a year for a faculty load, is the equivalent of 73 full-time people, or about $7 million. I see a poll. Marianne, did you just put that up or, or Monica? I did, yes. I didn't want to interrupt you, but we always love to get feedback so that we can continue to improve all of our offerings or free offerings for you. So if you don't mind taking just a quick moment to fill out that poll, I assure you it's really painless. Thank you. And Steve, feel free to, to continue going as we yeah. have the, the poll live. And, and there's no truth to the rumor that if you rate me excellent, I'll get a pink Cadillac. Um, <laughs> so um, checklist here for class size opportunities, things to think about, course frequency and modality. Do I need to offer this course every term? Do I need separate sections online or on campus or evening and daytime? Um, Proliferation of courses. Every time you add a course, you're basically spreading your existing student body more thinly over courses unless you're substituting it for something else. Um, so that's what creates proliferation. So where, the, where might there be opportunities? Um, one of the classic examples is uh, duplicative content. You know, intro statistics shows up as statistics in the math department and research methods in the social sciences and econometrics and a bunch of other places, business statistics, you know, if there's enough overlap in content, maybe you don't need all those different sections. Um, 
class size caps and targets. Often we ask where they came from. The answer is that's the size of the room I taught it in last year. Um, there are some physical and safety reasons and accreditation reasons for limits, but often there's more flexibility there than you may realize. Um, independent studies and that, that proliferation. Um, clinicals, internships, and student teaching just tend to be complicated things to do and manage. Um, other unusually small classes, and there may be opportunities across modalities, online, on campus, locations, and cross-institution. We're seeing more of that uh, with schools sharing courses. And we're just about out of time, so I'm going to go very quickly now. In terms of getting the data, there's seven main data sources, or up to seven. There's data by student, by instructor, by a course, and then the links, which students took which courses and who taught which courses. There are some departmental non-personnel overheads that get allocated. And for public institutions, we're also bringing in the variable part of, of those public appropriations. So that's what feeds it. Um, typically for us, it takes about a month for the school to respond to our data request. And then in probably another month to get everything all cleaned up and validated so everyone looks at and says, yeah, those numbers look right. Um, I mentioned that we do this with the instructor pay, where we split it into the instructional release and unassigned costs. For management and implementation, if you're looking at how do I adjust my class sizes, one thing to look at is scheduling. How many courses am I offering this term? How many sections of this course? Can I alternate these two courses, or do I need to offer them both every term? Um, when you're looking at hiring, um, when someone retires, do you replace them with similar skills or do you redeploy that, that resource and budget elsewhere? Um, prerequisites have some pretty severe effects um, in terms of requiring to offer courses every term rather than alternating them. And if a student misses one, they can be, you know, fall a year behind instead of just a term behind. Um, so looking at, at those types of issues in terms of how the curriculum is planned can be important. Um, new courses, is this gonna substitute for something else or add to the choices and spread your students more thinly? Um, so this idea is stuff to think about and these slides will be available. Um, we often introduce this information to a larger group at the university in a, in a workshop. And the goal of the workshop is to build a shared understanding of the data have everyone in the room gain confidence in it. They may identify some issues, usually straightforward to fix, but it's only the people who are who live and breathe that data who can actually say, well, that number doesn't look right because we've got a special policy for that. Um, develop some you know, initial findings and, and additional ideas, not only about what does it mean, but how are we going to use this? Who should have access? It's different from a program, program portfolio workshop, which I think Bob Atkins mentioned on the last masterclass, um, in that the portfolio program workshop is, tends to be more focused on specific decisions. What are the best new programs for institution? Where should we be investing for growth? Where should we be not investing for growth for that matter? This is more about figuring out how to use the information and getting some ideas where there may be further opportunities. In effect, the next level of questions to dig into. And that takes us to um, just a moment. If you want to reflect and think about, is there any of anything here you particularly want to remember um, for after the session? If you want to learn more about this, we do offer a course. Uh, with Bay Path University on academic program valuation and management, which brings into basically it's a, a deeper dive on everything that's covered in the series of master classes with some hands-on you know, opportunities. And there are two more master classes coming up in the next several weeks. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. And just as a reminder, uh, check your email. You will be getting a link to the video recording and the slides for not only this masterclass, but the previous one as well, just in case you missed it. Thank you again for coming. We really appreciate it. And uh, we will definitely get back to any of the questions that we did not get to today. Right. 
and you should feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about anything related to, to this uh, masterclass. Happy to respond. Yeah. Do you want to send, uh, you can send any of your questions to info at gray, G-R-A-Y, associates.com. Or Steve, do you want to share your uh, personal email there? Sure. Um, I'm at steve.probst, P-R-O-B-S-T, at grayassociates.com. Thank you all, and we hope to see you at Masterclass 3 on April 18th. Take care.